So good to be with you this Lord's Day evening. I had a different plan for tonight, but I had uh, some feedback from our last study. On last Tuesday night, we had a marriage study, and every, everybody there was encouraging me to, to bring forward that third lesson in our Traveling Companion series. We called this, This Is Your Captain Speaking. You know, after the first lesson that I preached on this, Jeff sent me an email, which he often does, full of wisdom and jokes and insights about the lesson. And he shared with me something I hadn't thought about, about, um, about canoeing. We talked about how you and your spouse are in the same boat in that first lesson. And Jeff said, you know, if you haven't been in a tandem kayak, you might not realize that the captain sits in the back so that he can steer and also so that he can stay in tune with what the other rower is doing and pay attention and stay in rhythm. Well, what does it really require to lead well? What does it really require to stay in rhythm and follow well? What does it require to collaborate and work together as a couple the way God wants us to do? I'm going to look at two passages to start off, both in Ephesians chapter 5. First in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, Paul says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Very simple words. In that one sentence, Paul sums up a Bible full of emphasis on wisdom. All of the passages in the Old Testament, he points back and says, remember everything you've learned. It is important to be wise in the way you live. It's not just important to be good, that's important. But part of being good and righteous and holy is making wise choices. That is, in the Hebrew, skillful living. Living with skill, like a pilot or a captain or a boatsman who knows how to handle the rough seas, who knows how to raise the sails at the appropriate time. Only he's not talking, of course. The Bible doesn't focus so much on how to steer a ship, but how to live a life. And so here Paul says, Look carefully. That's two words. The first has to do with watching. A captain has to watch. So does everybody else. The first mate on a boat has to watch. Pay attention to what's happening on the ship, around the ship. And then the second word, carefully, has to do with how we watch. Circumspectly, paying attention to every detail all around you. And what we're paying attention to is how we travel through life. How we walk is the metaphor Paul likes to use. That is, how we live. And the key distinction he pulls up here is not unwise, but wise. Well, a lot of other ideas are brought up between that verse and our next verse, but if we skip down half dozen verses to verse 23, we find another key point that we'll build on this, this evening. He says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Right there in that passage, he summarizes Everything he's about to say about a husband and a wife and about Christ and His church. Look at this. He's the head. That is the authority, the leader. The husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. But then he says, His body. Remember, we looked at that first in that first lesson, verse 27, this idea of being one flesh that is emphasized as Paul builds on this this metaphor that in some ways Christ is one with us and we are one with our spouse. One flesh. 
And that's about more than just flesh, of course, in Scripture. Saying we have a oneness that God has joined together and no one can separate. And then he says, and is himself its Savior. Here is the way Jesus leads. And here is the way a husband is to lead. Through loving, sacrificial service that brings holiness into those he leads. As Keith put it in our study, a captain's main job is to get people to their destination safely. And the destination of the people in your home that we need to be helping them get to is an eternal heaven, a new heaven and a new earth. That home that Adam just prayed about that God has in mind for those that He leads to this new life. So here's the big idea and everything else we're just going to be expounding on this. The big idea of this lesson is a home needs a captain. When I was first married, I didn't fully realize this. I thought, I'm supposed to be the head of the house somehow. I don't even know what that means. That means I put my foot down really hard a lot. What is that really about? Or maybe it's not that big a deal and we just try to figure everything out together. And the answer is a little bit There's a little bit of truth in both of those, but those are both actually wrong. A home needs a captain, both to pilot through rough seas and to chart the course ahead to help us wisely as a family navigate these troubles, get through this life, to be ahead. So I want to talk about three roles in this partnership. We're going to talk about the captain. We're going to talk about the first mate. We're going to talk about the admiral of the fleet. So first, let's talk about the captain. What does wise leadership look like? Well, there's a lot of ways to lead. There's a key truth. Maybe the most important passage on leadership in the whole Bible As Jesus instructs His disciples in Matthew chapter 20, if you want to turn your Bibles over there. So here in Matthew 20, in verse 25, Jesus said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. How do we lead? Well, I ask this question. What are the attributes and qualities and skills that a leader needs to effectively lead his home. And what is the difference between lording and leading? What is the difference between biblical leadership and what these Gentiles were doing? And i got to tell you, it still happens all over today, not just in governments either. What is the difference? And we saw, there were different comments brought up, but... It was discussed that that there's a different method, a different tone, different kind of openness. But just because we are leading as servants, just because we're not placing ourselves above but below in service, though we have authority to lead, doesn't mean we've eliminated all of the tools in our leadership toolbox. So, I... uh, recommended a book to our elders whenever I first came here. It's it's just a secular book on leadership, but it's something that has been helpful to me over the years. And it's called The Primes. And it's a bunch of kind of of back-of-the-napkin sketches that this this guy Chris McGough uses as he works with organizations, nonprofits, Fortune 500 companies, and every branch of the military to bring about organizational change. How do you do that? And he's worked a lot with the Pentagon, and he talks about this spectrum of leadership. 
And what he brings up is, he says, you know, a general said to me that they kept finding that they would go into these meetings and have difficulty getting through the meeting to accomplish anything whenever they were in the Pentagon working to create a plan, a vision for the future, where we should be going. And he couldn't figure out why. And then he realized they were trying to bring into every meeting they went into the same strategy of leadership. You know, when you're in the foxhole, the way Robert could maybe attest to this better than than any of us, when you're in the throes of battle, command and control is the kind of leadership you usually want. You don't have time to say, well, let's form a committee and let's sit down and, and think five years into the future. How will we want to have gotten out of this attack that's coming upon us at this exact moment? That's not going to work very well. What you have to do is say, look, I've been here before. I can get you out of this. You do this, you do that, and you do this. We're going to be okay. And they will follow you. These 18, 19 year olds who are there and, and all of the soldiers who are under your command want direction to get out of this situation. And I gotta tell you, there are situations as a husband and father where you need to pull out that kind of leadership. Where you say, look, here's what you do, here's what you do, we're gonna get through this. That can be servant leadership if that's what your family needs at that moment. But as they went into these meetings in the Pentagon and they would bring that approach into that meeting, they would find not very effective meetings. You do this, you do that. Well, people just separate themselves from the results. You're not getting the wisdom of the whole group. There's no buy-in to this long-term vision or the plan that we're putting together or whatever it is. And so he says, you know what? There are other kinds of leadership I could put in my pocket. You know, I could build to consensus. I could say, well, what do you think? Okay, well, here's what I think. Let's figure this out together. It's not letting go of any authority. It's just saying, let's figure this out together and, and agree together. What do we think is the best way forward? There might be some give and take. And in doing this, you, as a husband, don't rob yourself of all of the wisdom that your wife has. It's not saying the family is all of a sudden a democracy. It's saying you are stepping back and not lording over, but saying, I want to listen to what you have to say, to what you need, to what you are thinking is important right now. And we'll figure out together where we go. And in in the middle... Is planning. These, this more short term. This is long term. This is really short term. And in the middle is, okay, what are we going to do next week? Let's figure it out. And, and there's going to be a mix of the two in that. And I understand this is just a, an illustration or a model that, that hopefully helps us think through this, this uh, approach to leadership. But the core guiding principle in Scripture about what it means to be the head of the family. One word. You just read through Ephesians 5.22 to the end. Here's what you're going to find. Love. What does it mean to lead your wife, to be the head of your wife? You love her. And so every time you try to decide what kind of leadership mechanism I should use... What is going to help us together get where we need to go? You think, what is the most loving thing I can do here? Let's think about what it means to be the first mate. That is, what does wise following look like? Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3. Here we find in verses 1 to 6 some instructions to a wife. And specifically, he talks quite a bit here about a wife whose husband is not a Christian. And what we find here is that even though the wife isn't an authority 
in that from a position standpoint in the home, she has influence that she is meant to yield in the home. There is a kind of leadership that kind of from second chair she is meant to bring. And we start to see in verse 7 that husbands, in the way they lead, are primarily trying to understand their wives to bring influence. Remember, you can't save anyone (laughs) from this morning. You can't control anyone. All you can do is exercise influence from the appropriate role that you have been given. And so what we find here, let's look at these verses 1 through 6 first. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. Just the way you conduct yourself. It's what we find here. You can start to have an influence. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. And so wives have to find the confidence in the Lord to be submissive, to be followers, and yet to be influential to do their part through their very actions to start to influence the the marriage and their spouse. Husbands, it says in verse 7, are to live with their wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. So, in an understanding way, you dwell with your wife and you deal with them with honor as the weaker vessel. So last week we went to, last weekend we went to the Indiana Children's Museum, Children's Museum of Indianapolis, I think. And they had a big Star Trek display, which was very cool. And um, I'm not a big Trekkie, but I like Star Trek. And we were able to sit down in the captain's chair. That was pretty neat. And you know what I said as soon as I sat down, if if you like... Star Trek, the next generation at all. Engage. Make it so, number one. Number one is Commander Riker. If that, that, was, that was Picard. Picard. That was not Pickard. That was Captain Picard, not Captain Kirk. And his number one is his second in command, his first mate, Commander Riker. And whenever the captain gives an order... He trusts his first mate to get it done. This is something very powerful that we can miss about marriage. Is that we are a team. Captain and first mate. A team designed by God to work together, to collaborate, to get a job done. To make it so, number one. We have the husband as the head and the wife as the helper. The helper perfectly suitable. The help meet, as the King James says. The perfect corresponding partner to help the head get done what needs to be done. Now, what I'm about to say is so obvious that it is almost insulting to say, but I'm going to say it. Women are incredibly capable. (laughs) Our wives can get things done. Our wives, men, want to help us get things done. Most wives want to be led, want to be effective as a partnership, as a team. 
the way we broke down sometimes roles in business, we would talk about a leader and a manager. And sometimes those are the same person, but they're two different hats that you're wearing. The leader starts visioning, starts saying, here's the long-term goal, here are the big picture priorities, here's where we want to go. And the manager says, all right, I got that. I'll get it done. We talked about in our study, we might say, however you want to organize the house, that's fine. I just want to make sure we're able to be hospitable. So organize for that. Otherwise, you have control. Get it done how you want to do it. Make it so, number one. And there's a million ways that that we might say that, that we might partner in that way. But as leaders, we need to make sure that we are leading towards that eternal destination and helping find those stops along the way. And we need to be doing it through influence, through communication, through partnership, through tremendous listening, which we all can always grow in. Or else we're trying to do it like another Star Trek group of characters, the Borgs. If you've never heard of the Borgs, this is a very geeky lesson. If you've never heard of the Borgs, they're this, this group of, I think, part robot people that try to assimilate, to try to completely control someone else. And it just is not how God wants us to lead. We are upside down leaders. It's not effective anyways. But, but we turn everything upside down when we see through the eyes of Scripture and through the cross the way we lead. And so, we listen, we think what's best for our family, and we move forward. And slowly, isn't automatically right there when you first get married, but slowly, you build more and more trust as a leader. And more and more trust as a helper. And the more that trust grows, the more powerful you are as a team to to be fruitful in God's service. And so you have to be reliable for your commitments, reliable for what you tell each other you're going to do, reliable for your love for each other. You're going to make mistakes, but being blameless just means when I make a mistake, I'm going to go and I'm going to own it. I'm going to ask for forgiveness. I'm going to try to do better. And we're going to keep figuring this out slowly as we go. Of course, the husband does not have all authority. The real authority comes from the admiral of the fleet. Our true captain, the chief shepherd of our souls, the real leader of our lives and our families is Jesus Christ. So how do we stay in constant communication with headquarters? Right after where we first started, Ephesians 5 and verse 15, when we get to verse 17, it starts to help us understand what it looks like to be wise. He says, do not be unwise, but understand the will of the Lord. What does it look like not to be unwise? What does it look like to be wise? It means to understand the will of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, how do you do that? There's there's only one way. The directive, the prime directive, the, the... way that we're guided, the principles, the navigation, everything that leads us is in the Scriptures. And so we have to, as a couple and as individuals, constantly go back to what the Admiral is trying to get us to understand. Adrian read a while back about this study about marathon runners. Maybe Laura can vouch for this or say that no, that's not actually true. But what this study found is that when you're running a marathon, if you wait until you're thirsty to get some water, you'll be far less effective in your pace as a runner than if there's periodic water breaks before you're thirsty set up along the way and you take a break to drink. Well, what does that have to do with what we're talking about? 
you can't wait until you have some crisis in your marriage or in your life to look to the Scriptures. To go and talk to the elders and say, I don't know what to do about this. To, to say, let's, let's go to God and pray about this. Maybe we should start a practice of, of studying the Scriptures every once in a while. No, you have to do that all along the way. You need it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So here's your challenge. We did this work at our study and it was really fun, really inspiring to hear what everyone came up with. This is a couple challenge. I, I don't have a single variation for it, so you guys get a pass if you're single on this. But those who are married, as a couple, you think about two things. What's your North Star? That is, what is the guiding principle? Find a verse together. Husbands, this is an opportunity for you to lead in this building consensus approach, but guiding. You have veto power, but you need to lead to that proper place where you both see a vision of who you need to be. Find a verse or a phrase or even a word that is the prime thing that's going to direct you. And then... Think about, okay, short term, where are we trying to go? Where do you want to go as a couple in the coming months or years even? Where would you like to, to bring your children to? What kind of new practices or habits would you like in your family? Is there something you'd like to get involved in as a family in the church? Or something you need to cut back in as a family, because it's starting to crowd out important things. Think about what is your guiding principle. And there's a lot here, right? But think about what is going to help you stay on course. And then where do you want to go? And, and just set, could be just one goal. A captain's job is to get his crew and his passengers safely home. Jesus Christ is reliable for that if you make him your captain. If you say, I'm with Jesus, he will show you what it looks like to have someone carry you on their back. Say, I will lead as your servant and I will get you there. It takes trusting Him. It takes trusting Him so much you're willing to obey Him. It takes submitting to Him, dying with Him in the waters of baptism, and rising to walk with Him for the rest of your life. If you're not a Christian, please come forward while we stand and sing.